So good morning. It's first thing in the morning. It's about 7, 7.30. The sun's just come up 20 minutes, half an hour ago. Had enough time to grab a coffee. I'm just scouting the terrain that I'm in, looking for a couple mushrooms. I won't make that a major part of this video. I put a half decent amount of mushroom stuff in the last one. But uh, if I come across some really promising ones, I'll throw that in the video. But I'm, I'm just, like I said, looking for something that I can have with my dinner. And uh, if I see anything that's really nice, I'll throw it in. So the area I'm in, I'm seeing lots of different types of mushrooms. I do believe this one's edible. But not 100% on that. Same with these. So I'm not taking chances. I'm really out looking primarily for chanterelles, but you can see there's a fairly diverse range. There's a little one here. There's a fairly diverse range of different kinds of mushrooms in the area. I mean, I'm lucky in that regard, but like I say, my primary mission is looking for the chanterelles. That's, that's really, if I find a pine mushroom or a lobster mushroom, I'll feel myself lucky, but I'm not seeing much of those. I think we have ourselves a death cap mushroom here, a couple of them. I don't even touch these. They're one of the most poisonous mushrooms on the planet. You eat even a small piece of that and you're dead. It's one of those things. So I just thought I'd show it on the camera. If, if you come across a mushroom like this and you think it looks tasty, don't touch it, don't eat it, just walk away. <laughs> well, as you can see, I only came across two little chanterelles. I'll add them, I've got some potato and onion and stuff, so I'll just throw them in the stew pot for later. Okay, so just heading back into where I've done previous camps in the past. If I remember correctly, this is where I did the Pyramid Turp Shelter a few videos back, but looks like it's still in half decent state where I cleared off the ground and stuff from there. I want a nice wide flat area that I can set up this shelter in. So I thought this would be a prime zone to set things up in. So let me just uh, catch my breath, get my bag up, and we'll get on with this video. All right, so like I say, I just got to throw my bag up here. It's been really moist in the area I'm in. I'm in a rainforest location on the west coast of Canada. And even though the temperatures get cold, uh, the moisture is... Just always present. <laughs> but uh, so I've kind of adapted over time to make sure that I hang everything from off trees and stuff to get up off the moisture of the ground. So I just use a marlin spike hitch on a line that I looped around the tree and kind of threw the tag end through the loop. And uh, just put a marlin spike hitch with a toggle on there. It allows me to just hang my bag. For people that have watched previous videos, you'll see this pretty well in every video. I really do try to just make it a habit of getting up off the ground. And for those that have watched a lot of previous videos, you'll start to see me slowly adapting into my cold weather gear. So I've got my uh, uh, Thermarest rigid rest um, foam pad for going on the ground. The temperature, I think the temperature right now is about one degree Celsius, maybe zero, one, maybe two degrees Celsius. Still pretty cold. So needless to say, bags up. I'll just stop, take a break here. I'll probably go down to the river. I need to find a red cedar. I want to harvest some off. Now, I might even hike back out to the car and grab some more wood. There's some stuff I want to show in this video of uh, how to use char material how to make it, how, how to, you know, when you're out in the field, how to produce it, and then how to use it to make your fires. So in order to cut down on some of the time of the video, I'll probably hike back out of the car, grab a small stack of wood and bring it in. I'll still have to go and harvest some wood off the land, but it'll just help save me time for later on. But either way, this is up now. So I might take some scenes when I'm down at the river. Like I say, I just got to find a, a red cedar that I can harvest some of the outer bark off of. It's going to be a critical component to what I'm wanting to do here. And I'll probably stop and take a drink out of the river, just so I'm not uh, feeding off my water supply. Alright, well, just as evidence, I was a little bit uh, under in my estimation. It's about 3-4 degrees Celsius. So, it's a little warmer than I thought it was. 
mind you, I checked about an hour or two ago and it was, like I said, down around zero, one degrees Celsius or so, right in between those two. But uh, yeah, it's starting to warm up a little bit. Hopefully it gets up to about 10 degrees Celsius in the day. We'll see how it goes. Either way, I'm off down to the river now. So, the area I'm in, I can't seem to find a red cedar along the shoreline. So I'll have to go for a little hike, you know. Of course, it's always when you're looking for them, you can't find one, right? But I'll have to go for a little hike. There's lots of red cedar in this area, so it shouldn't be difficult to find. But I might as well just stop and get myself a bit of water. This is a life straw. It allows you to drink out of questionable water sources and just have clean, filtered water on demand. Saves me having to process quite as much water later on. I say these are life straws. I just wear it around my neck like a necklace. So I don't know if the camera's picking this up that good or not, but it's about a black bear over on the other side of the creek there. He's about 150, 200 pounds or so. Kind of hanging out. It's been watching over here for the last five, 10 minutes or so. So and I think the bear we're going after some uh, salmon that are in the creek. I'll stick the GoPro in there and see if I can uh, get some footage of them. Alright, well, I love the bear get back to eating salmon and uh, get back to my camp. Like I say, I think I'm going to have to go for a bit of a hike now. The closest red cedars I know of are about a kilometer away, so I'm going to go off and I'll cut back when I get out to there. Okay, so I managed to find myself a red cedar here. Fair size one. So I'm just going to use the 90 degree spine on the back of my knife. I'm going to scrape it against the bark of the tree and harvest off a tinder pile. I'll show you that once I've done that. There's just no good place to really set up the camera at this location. So let me just harvest this and I'll, I'll show you the end result. Okay, so I'm back to my base camp again. So and I just had a piece of wood that was sitting around and I used that to kind of prop this up so you can see it on the camera better. But all I did really was take the 90 degree spine on the back of the knife and scrape it against the red cedar tree. And when you do that, it forms this kind of fluff, if you will. So I gathered up, you know, half decent sized handful and I'll use that to get the fire going later on. At this point in time, I'm just going to let it sit. It's been raining lots in the area I'm in. Today's the first sunny day we've had here in a while. So I'm just going to let this sit in the sun and kind of dry out a bit. The volatile oils inside the cedar will still want to take one way or the other, but it makes it easier if things are drier, right? So I'll just let this sit and I'll move on to actually getting the camp up and running now. So as with almost all my videos, I like to build a little improvised tripod to get my camera up so that I'm filming more up at eye height. So I see that there's some sticks lying around on the forest floor here that are about the diameter of a thumb or so. And there's half decent amount of other ones in the background here. So I'm just going to go harvest off three straight six to seven foot length sticks that are roughly about the size of my thumb and build my tripod. Okay, so I've managed to harvest off the sticks and just gather them really. Enough. They're just laying around on the forest floor. So we've got a 28 inch length of cordage where I've tied in a fisherman's knot. I double it up on itself so it's two loops. And then I turn around and take the three sticks. I wrap it around all three of the sticks. Put it down about four or five inches or so. You know, a good hands, a hands, uh, and then I take that middle stick and I just start to rotate it. I've shown this in lots and lots of videos in the past, of, but it's a tried and true method I find. So I'll just step back a little bit. And you just keep looping that middle stick round and round, and it'll start to become taut on the other two sticks. 
and when it gets to the point where it looks like it's not going to be able to turn anymore, and you could even bring it back a half one and set it out. So this tripod is not the strongest in the world. It's only designed to hold up a camera. You do the exact same thinking when it comes to uh, wanting to put a tripod over top of your fire to hang your cook gear and that kind of stuff on. But uh, that's exactly what I'll be using this for is putting the camera on just to get it up to high height. And this is amply strong enough for that. Okay, and for the people that haven't watched previous videos, just to show you, the loops, when you wind that middle stick, they kind of tighten off on each other and form almost like a, a frapping lashing, if you will. But there you have it. For people that have watched previous videos, this is all old hat, but in my perspective, being able to whip together tripods quickly and easily and be able to reclaim the cordage afterwards is an invaluable skill set to have when you're in the wilderness. So I like to show this in my videos because I use them all the time. Okay, so for the next step of the video, I'm going to be putting up a ridge line at about seven foot high in the tree, so above head height. I'm going to be connecting to this tree right here, and I'm going to be connecting to this tree right here. So I've got a fairly large hank of rope that I'm using as my ridge line. The distance between these two trees is probably about 15, 20 foot. But uh, I've got a loop on the one end. The thinking really is I'm going to end up coming around the tree and then I'm going to take the lead line that I've got coming off. I'll just drop my hank. I'm going to take this lead line. I'm going to feed it through the loop that's on the line. I'm going to stick a stick through that little loop and then I'm going to pull and apply tension. But I want this up as high as I can possibly get it. As close as to seven foot, seven and a half foot up as, as I can. And given that I'm only six foot tall, I'll reach as far as I can. And when I run at arm, I run at arm, right? <laughs> so I'm just going to hook that on as high as possible. And then I'll run over to the other tree. So I used the stump that was kicking around my camp to get up even a little bit higher. This thing's sitting up at about seven and a half foot high now, give or take. And you can see the stick just kind of locks things. So now when I apply tension, it'll just hold it in place. So now I'll run this ridge line across to the other tree, yeah? So now it'll be the same on this side. I brought over the stump just to kind of help me get up a little higher. I want this to be, like I say, seven and a half, even close to eight foot off the ground. And the reason why I'm doing this is later on when I apply tension to this line, it'll have a bit of sag. So by having it up higher than the needed height, when the sag happens on the paracord, it'll just help offset that. So I'll just pull the rest of my line around. And I want a lot of tension sitting on this uh, ridge line. It's going to be holding a significant load. So I'm not going to do uh, you know, my rapid ridge line like I normally would here. Even though that's strong, I want the maximum strength I can possibly get out of this ridge line. So I'll do a close up of the knots and how I'm going to set that up to give it maximum tension. So hopefully I can get the camera to give this justice. So I want to take the line that's hooked on the tree. This is my main ridge line now. I want to grab it and kind of create a loop as such. I want to reach in. I want to try to get this on camera, right? I want to pull on that ridge line now and pull towards the tree. That gives me a loop now where I can then feed the tag line that I had wrapped around the tree through and gives me a point of leverage where I can apply tension. So now when I go to make this taut I can apply ample amounts of tension. Now I'll switch angles so you can see. Hopefully this is a better angle. It always gets tricky when you're in the woods doing this kind of stuff, right? Trying to get the proper angles with the lighting and the trees and everything. But, so, the tag line I'm going to pull and keep applying tension. But because we have this loop here now, it's almost like having a pulley. It gives you the extra leverage you need to really crank down on this. So I can set this extremely tight. In fact, I'll just come around the tree and see if I can 
get it to even be tighter. Use another point of leverage. Now I'm going to just kind of pinch that with my fingers so it's not going anywhere. Now I want to pinch that whole set together. Now I'm going to take the loop, or I'm going to take the tag line, the rope. I'm going to wrap it as a loop around. I'm going to reach through, pinch the remaining tag line with my fingers, and pull that through. And by doing such, I'm just kind of setting it. By doing such, it creates kind of a half hitch that locks everything into place. Now all I need to do is put a stick into here and pull on this line and it'll keep everything really taut. I just put a stick now in through that loop and apply tension to the tag end and it locks that knot. If I pull this stick out, I can just pull on this tag line and the whole knot will release. I can slide it off this loop and just snap the loop out of place and it'll all quick release. But either way, it gives an extreme amount of tension to this line, which is exactly what I want. Okay, so the ridge line is fully up now. It might even be closer to eight foot. It's up quite high. So when I come down the line though, right where I'm gonna be making my tie out point for the shelter, I've got two prusik loops. One's a little bit longer than the other, and that's not critical, but they're sitting right side by each with each other. And that's kind of on the halfway point of the ridge line to where I want it. I had another prosthetic sitting on the line, but I don't need that one for this example. And then that's where we did the trucker's hitch, the kind of rapid trucker's hitch that gave us the really taut line. So the ridge line's up though, either way, right? Okay, and for today's shelter setup, I'm gonna be using in my yellow dry bag down on the bottom, I've got a 10 foot by 13 foot AquaQuest Defender King Camo tarp. And I've got some, uh, uh, tent pegs that are sitting in the bag, so I'm gonna pull those out and get them ready, yeah? Okay, so I've got my uh, tarp and my tent pegs. I'm just gonna pull the tarp out of the bag and uh, set it out flat on the ground so I can do things with it there. So I'll cut back when this is fully out and laid out nice. There's no sense in you guys watching me fumble around with the tarp for five minutes. <laughs> So I've laid the tarp out flat now. This is the 13 foot side on this side and the 10 foot side on that side. So the thinking really is I'm going to take the, along the 13 foot side, I'm going to fold it in half here. I'm going to bring this side over and onto that side. So you can see now, all I did was take the tarp and fold it in half. So this is still the 10 foot side here. And this has now become six and a half foot because where it's folded in half, the 13 divided by two, right? So these two corners, I want to take those and use a tent peg and peg them out together to each other. And I want to do that where the prussics, where we had the two prussics side by each on the ridge line. I want to do that right below that. And I want to do it back about two foot back. So I just shifted the camera angle to try to make sure that this part was really clear. So those are the two corners that we've got that'll be pegged together onto the ground. And then directly above that, we've got the two prosics that were sitting side by each on the ridge line. And this whole tarp setup has come back about two foot. So it's not directly underneath, it's back a bit. Okay, so at this point in time, because I've done this a hundred times, and Got my knees wet. I'm going to uh, just set my stool to the side. I'm going to put on my knee pads. This ground is wet and I don't want to have it soak into me as I'm uh, putting in the tent pegs and that kind of stuff. So I won't go through the graphic details of that, but I'll cut back when I'm starting to peg it down. Yeah. So for the corner where we're going to peg down these two corners, I want to take the top tarp. You see the camo is faced up here. The brown or green color depending on how the camera records this, the, the khaki color that's on the inside is really for the inside of the shelter. I want the camo to the outside. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of pull this a little bit and I want to flip it over on itself because when I go to put those tent pegs in, I want them kind of that way instead, if that's clear enough. And then when the tent peg, I want, if you've got one that has a hook on it, I want that facing towards the ridge line. So I'm just going to 
set that in. And like I said, I've got both of those hooked on. And I want to drive that right down tight to the earth. There's just a little tiny bit of room where well, there's just a little bit of room where I can hook on other things if I need to later on. And you'll see why I've done that. So now I'll cut angles and explain out my next step. Okay, so this was the two corners we just pegged to each other and to the earth. Now where the fold point was back here, I'm going to pull this taut and then I'm going to peg it down but I'm going to peg it down with a guy line attached to that peg and I'm going to run it inside the tarp through and over and out that side. So as you can see this is where the fold was so I'm going to pull that nice and taut to the front I want that to have a significant amount of tension it doesn't have to be like you know Herculean or anything but it definitely has to be taut and then I'm going to take a loop of the guy line that I have. This is about a 15 foot length of guy line. And like I say, this is just going to be fed through there. So what I'm going to do is just tie them both on to that same point. Pull that nice and taut. Make sure there's ample tension there. And I want to drive that right into the earth and make sure that that guy line's hooked on good and solid at this point. And this side, the little hook that's on the tent peg can go right in the earth. I don't want any chance of this guy line coming loose. So like I say, I'll take the guy line and just feed it all the way through and have it come out over on the other side. So this is where we just pegged down at the fold line there and I've run the guy line through and it pops out now on this side and it, that guy line already had a prussic on it. So I'll move on to the next step which will be the two points that are out or the two corners that are out on this end. I'm going to bring these together and they're going to get pegged over here where the first two were pegged down originally. Leave a tent peg and rock there for a second. I could use that first tent peg we originally did, but I'm going to do a separate tent peg just because I can. So the thinking really now is going to be these two corners are going to be pegged with the camo side facing up, and I want those pegged right. You could just hook right on to the existing ones, but in fact I'm just going to drive those right into the ground so they're good and solid, there's no coming loose. But right beside them I'm going to peg in the last two corners with the camel side facing upward and I'm going to peg that in as close as I can right beside the other tent peg. Now with this tent peg it's not going to go all the way in we're going to have that hook which is facing towards this little hook on the on the uh, tent bag is going to be facing towards the ridge line and we're going to leave that I know it looks convoluted because I've got these guy lines just on the tarp to begin with but they're not going to be used in this example but I'm just going to set this tent peg on and now I'm going to leave a little bit of room and you'll see why in a little bit it's on there where they're they're holding on good and firm but I want just a little bit of just a little bit of space where I could slip those on and off if I need to. So now if you remember we attached the guy line to this point here and had run it out through. Well that's now sitting here. I'm going to lift that guy line up and attach it to the ridge line, prusik to prusik. Okay. So this is the guy line. And this is the prusik that I've got sitting on the guy line that's tied out to that fold point. So I'm going to take this prusik loop, I'm going to fold it onto itself, I'm going to reach in, grab the two pieces of cordage there, 
and I'm going to open it up and form a pocket. This creates a lark's head knot. Now I've got this stout stick. I'm going to slide that on and I'm just going to make sure it cinches down onto it good. Now I've got a toggle point sitting on that prusik. I'll use that to hook through the prusik that's up on the ridge line. So I simply take that toggle, grab the prusik, I feed the toggle through that prusik. I've now got the two prusiks attached to each other and this guy line that's tied off to the fold point, I'm just going to slide that guy line up and apply tension. Make sure it's really taut. The guy line that was tied out at the fold point has now been pulled taut and is connected up to the ridge line up here. And now the tarp itself has to be pulled taut and connected to the other prusik that's up there. And then in order to make sure that the front is really uh, at an optimal size, I'm going to get a six and a half foot stick and it's going to set in under here. And then you'll see as we go. So if you've watched previous videos, you know that I carry six to eight foot lengths of cordage that I keep in little bundles, little hanks. And they've got a loop tied on one end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the tie out loop that's on the tarp. I'm going to just feed the loop through. I'm going to take the tag end of itself and pull it through. And that way I've got the guy line strapped on to this point of the tarp. I'm going to take this, I'm going to run it up to that second prusik that we had sitting up on the ridge line. And just like we did with the ridge line itself, where we use the loop to apply additional tension, I'm going to use the prusik that's on the ridge line to apply tension. I don't want to be hooked onto that. <laughs> and I want to make sure that that's on there really taut. And I'll use the same kind of knots that I did on the ridge line to kind of lock and set everything in place. So I'll just cut back when it's all tied off and optimized and then we'll put a stick in to brace it so that it's optimally sitting up exactly where it should be. So now with this tarp, there's still a bit of sag here. I need to use a stick to push this up and that way the entrance of the shelter becomes taut. So I know that this was a 13 by 10 tarp, so I've cut a stick that's a little over six and a half feet because you want to have a bit of tension. And on the end, I'm just going to, don't do this at home kids, on the end I'm just going to uh, put a little tiny pocket that the paracord can sit into just to give it something to kind of hook a little easier. And this wood's so wet, it just gets into the teeth of the saw real easy. So I just did a little tiny V at the top of the cut. And it's really just, like I say, when this gets set into the cordage, I want the pull to just kind of bite into the cordage a little. So I'll shift camera angles and then I'll put the pole in. So like I say, this pole's been cut to length. It's got the little V-notch in the top. I'm just going to set the bottom of the pole right where those four corners met where the two tent pegs were. I'll set that right there. Then I'm going to just lift up the tarp, apply tension, and let, let the stick bite into that paracord. And then it comes set up against the knots that are already established there. This causes the doors, or will be the doors, to become tighter. You'll see in the next couple minutes here. So the thinking really is, I pull out the sides on both sides now, and all of a sudden we have a shelter that has doors and a floor. So I'm just going to grab another tent bag now. Grab my stone. Now what you want to do is 
and you come along and there's a tile point that's really the halfway point of that side. I want to pull that out and I want to make that taut and drive it into the ground. And this one you want to be nice and tight. I'm going to do the exact same thing on the other side. So I'm going to take the tie out that's at the halfway point on this side. I'm going to pull it out, make sure it's nice and tight. Now, get a significant amount of tension to it. And drive that right to the earth. set it a little tighter in a minute. So there's only one more step that really has to be done if you want to optimize it but even at this point in time it's fully functioning. So I can turn around and remember I set one of those tent pegs not all the way into the earth. It allows me to open up my door and when I open the door you can see I might have to change the camera angles. You'll be able to see that there's a complete floor. So in this configuration it allows you to have an absolute sealed shelter where you have a door that you can open and close and a floor from a 10 by 13 tarp. I'll just close the door again for two seconds. There's one or two more things we can do to optimize this to really make it, you know, storm proof and all that business. But as you can see, that's one of the reasons why we left the tent peg where we had the hook. We left the hook a little bit above the earth and that way it allows these tie outs to just hook on or take off at ease. Now, when it comes to the tie outs here, I've already got a guy line tied on here. I could easily turn around and lash these two door pieces together so even in heavy winds this door is not going to blow open or anything it's not airtight sealed normally you don't want it to be but it's definitely sealed enough where it's going to keep the better part of the elements out but I'll just pop that off and open the door again and just change camera angle so you can see the inside this is one of my favorite shelter setups so I'll just go into it now. So you can see, other than the little crack right down the middle, even that could be tied out and brought closer to each other. There's a tie out point sitting on the line right there where the paracord is. Those two pieces could be tied and brought tighter together. But to me, this gives an effective, oh, I'll just get that stick out of there. This gives an effective ground sheet and really seals your shelter right in from the elements. So I'll do a pan around, a pan around with the door open and the door closed. So the shelter is 10 foot wide on its face. Each one of those doors at the base of it has a width of five foot and the entrance is six and a half foot tall. So it's easily big enough for an individual to stand inside and have the door closed. There's only one little catch that still has to be done on this shelter. I might as well talk about it now. Uh, you can see there's a bit of kind of sag that sits on this side. I could turn around and put in some sort of rock or pebble and create a tie-out point to pull it firm. But instead of doing that, the more ideal option is to hook on a couple more guy lines to these points and run them out and have them connect into those tent pegs and it keeps everything square on these sides. Like I say though, this definitely is one of my favorite shelters. There's this and another one that has doors to it, but it doesn't have the floor like this one does. It gives you a bit more room. It allows you to sleep three 
but it doesn't have the floor. Whereas this is ideal for a single person. If you've got a bag and everything else and you want to get out of the elements, this is the shelter of choice in my perspective. So I'll show you the guy outlines and we'll tie those out on the edges and that way everything's kind of more taut and firm on these outside edges. And then uh, I'll see the shelter is completed. Throw in my sleeping mat and sleeping bag and stuff and show you the size of that and ratio to the inside. So I'll just show you now, I'm six foot tall. You can see it's easily big enough where if I had to, I could be standing on the inside, have the door closed and I'm still covered and out of the elements. So it's good in that regard. You get a ton of headroom in this shelter. You lose a little bit of the space compared to some of the other configurations I do. But I really, really like this shelter. You know, if you're in rain, rainforest conditions like I am, this is one of the best ones to stop the moisture from coming up under the earth and to have doors that you can just seal and shut down and stop the elements from coming in. It really makes this one of my, if not my favorite shelter. So now I'm just going to do the last finishing touch. So I've got a hank of rope. It's got a loop on the end. My six to eight foot length guy lines are just a little bit too shy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this loop onto this corner right here. I'm going to run it through the inside of the shelter. I'm going to loop it around the tent peg that's in the back. And then I'm going to come out and connect it over to this side and just tie it off. So I've attached the guy line running around the base of the shelter now. You can see it kind of pulls out the sides a little bit more. And it just makes sure that there's tension set on them. I'll go in inside and show you what I've done there, but here's the other side. You can see it kind of becomes more squared. I didn't show this part on camera because it just wasn't elegant to do on camera. <laughs> I was inside and outside of the shelter, you know, putting the guy line through and that kind of stuff. But hopefully I can catch that with the camera. You can see in the back corner there, the orange ridge line running along. It's the same on this side. There's an orange ridge line running along there too. So that guy line that I used to kind of square that off had a Prusik loop on it. And I just used the Prusik to apply tension over on that final tent peg. And it just loops around the one in the back. Now as an additional step, one of the last things you could do if you really wanted to kind of batten this thing down for bad weather would be, you can use a stone. There's tutorials on YouTube of how to do that stuff, but you can use a stone where you push a pebble and you make a lark's head knot with a loop and you just kind of hook it on and you can do an improvised tie out and pull it out with guy lines and it gives a, a little bit of additional shoulder and head space in the shelter i don't feel the necessity to do that at this point in time i feel like this already has ample room for what i need it to be okay well now that the shelter's up like i said i'll throw the ground mat down and put my sleeping bag in and you guys can see the size of that and ratio to the inside of the shelter so I've thrown in the ground mat and the sleeping bag and put my stool out. So it gives you an idea of the size and space in there. I don't know if the lighting is really that great. The forest, I mean, is fairly dark. And it's, it's quite a thick forest, so it just doesn't let a lot of light in. And there's mountains on both sides, but as you can see, there's easily enough room for you to sleep comfortably and have a large area to put gear into. And having those ground sheets down, if you will, just makes it that you don't have to worry about the moisture. If I was really anal about it, I'd turn around and tie it all out and that way it was really taut to itself and there wasn't that kind of little space in between. But I'm happy with the way it is. I like the setup. So, just gonna swing the door back shut again. Like I say, I'll tie it all off and stuff, show it in a kind of lockdown position. But uh, this is the assault shelter. Like I say, it's probably one of my favorite shelters. Well, it's time for me to stop and take a break, and it's time for you guys to do some work. If you haven't subscribed yet, please like, share, and subscribe. You know, I'll take a break here for a few minutes and then kick over to the next part of the video. So we're at the point in the day where I got to put together the tripod for cooking with. There's smaller diameter trees that are over in that area. So I'm going to go in and harvest a couple more of those and get my tripod together for that. So I'm 
just going to stop and get a bit more water. Or am I taking a break for a few minutes? If you hear some gunshots and stuff in the background, don't be surprised. There's a few other uh, bushcraft people that are in the area doing wilderness stuff. So, they like to get out with the guns, right? So, like I said, I need to uh, put my tripod together to start cooking dinner with later on. And this looks like an ideal candidate to harvest some wood from. So, I'm just going to take three straight pieces that look fairly stout. And, uh, you know, six, seven foot in length. And, uh harvest them off yeah so I managed to get some water down to the river there harvested off some uh, sticks so I got three more sticks these ones should be a little stronger a lot of the sticks that are in the forest are fairly soft and rotted and the ones that are down by the river are a little more solid different type of wood right so uh, I went and harvested these three and uh, I'll throw together my cooking tripod now I won't bother putting that on the video because you guys already saw me whip together the tripod the camera's on as we speak uh, earlier in the video. So I'll just kind of get that together and have it up and running, yeah? I've lashed together the tripod, <clears throat> got that ready to kind of go over the fire. I've got to throw up my grill onto that as my next step. Okay, so just hold my grill out of the bag. <coughs> I'm not overly worried about clearing out the area underneath. Normally I am. I'll clear it out, don't get me wrong. But I've had fires in this exact location in the past. So I know that the land is pretty settled that way, if you will. And of course, as soon as the camera's rolling, the chain's got to get tangled, right? <laughs> Every time. So I'll cut back. So now I've got my chain. I hang my pot on. Just got little S hooks on the chain. Just wrap that around the tripod. Hook the S hook into the links. And now just start to wrap that around. Wrap that around a few times. Now that just is left to hang. I can probably go one more time. So now I've got an S hook on the other side of the chain. I'll just shift the camera angle probably. No, we should be good. Just take my grill. It's got an O-ring on the grill. I just connect the S hook of my chain to the O-ring on the grill. And I'm now lashed on. And I've got my grill ready hanging over the fire. Just a little S hook that connected the chain, bundled it on. And there's an S hook here, just holds on to the O-ring that connects off to the grill. And then if I want to adjust the height of this, I simply just wrap the chain around the top of the tripod a couple times and it can raise or lower the grill that way. And if I want to shift it left or right, up and down, I just simply move the legs of the tripod and it allows me to have fine control over exactly where the grill is positioned over the flame. So I've packed in a bit of wood from the vehicle. I went back out and grabbed some. I don't have huge piles, but I'll gather more. But in this video, I wanted to focus not so much on processing wood. You guys have seen me do that in lots of different videos if you've watched previous ones. But we gathered that red cedar bark earlier in the day and I'm going to use char material to get that going and in this portion of the video I want to show the life cycle of char and and how you kind of get more of it and continue to have it in your kit as you move through time so one of the very first things I'm going to do when it comes to that is I've got a steel tin like an Altoids tin and that kind of thing and I've gathered up some branches these are wet they're kind of punky they come off of the trees that are in the area there's tons of little branches that are off these trees i'm just breaking off ones that aren't too soft those ones are all pretty dead but i'm just going from tree to tree 
looking for anything that has a bit of bone to it. If it breaks way too easy, it's too brittle, it's not worth having. Like these ones are all soft. But all I'm really doing is walking up to a tree like here, get rid of all the moss and stuff on the outside of it, and I'll snap off that piece. I'll make sure this is big enough to fit in the tin and I'll just add it to the tin. So I'm gonna pack that tin that I have there just walk back over to it. I'm gonna pack that tin that I have full of this kind of half punky dead wood coming off the trees. Okay, so you can see I filled this tin. This wood isn't even dry. This is damp wood. It's kind of spongy because it's half rotten. I'm gonna put a lid on that. Let's figure out where my lid went. Oh, over here. And this will be the next generation of char that'll be made. So I'm just going to put my lid on that, make sure it seals up really well. If it's open and looks like it's half open or anything, take out the wood until you make sure that it's completely closed. So that'll be, like I said, the next generation of char material. For my first generation of char material, I've got a piece of cotton sitting in here. I've already got existing char. Kind of blackened. There's a piece of wood that the process has already been done to. So the thinking really is a fair rod spark. I'm just going to put the lid back on that because I don't need to get it going quite yet. But if you toss a rod spark into char material, it takes an ember really easily. Then you can use that ember to blow the red cedar bark that we harvested earlier in the video into a flame. So in past videos, I've gone off and harvested you know, small sticks off dead trees and that kind of stuff and built up small sticks to large sticks. In this video, what I'm going to do is just take some of this wood that I've brought in and split it down so I have small kindling and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to do that and really make it a minor part of this video. The main heart of this is to show you the art of using char. So let me just get my tinder ready and uh, kind of get that stuff together. And then we'll cut back to actually making the fire. So there was a stump that was here from the last time I was here. I hauled it from over there. Somebody had logged it and then just left it, which is, you know, always charming. And I'm just going to use it to uh, take some of these smaller pieces and baton them down to be just small sticks, and that way I don't have to go out and try to harvest. Okay, so as you can see, I've processed down some of the wood that I packed in. And it's a small pile, but I've got some small sticks there, move up to larger sticks, and then hopefully into the fuel wood. I know it's a skinny pile, but this is dry seasoned wood, so it shouldn't be a problem to go. So I'm gonna uh, start to get the uh, fire ready for the next scenes, and hopefully we'll have the fire going in the next two or three minutes. Okay, so the first order of business I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that cedar pile, the shavings, the uh, cedar bark shavings. I'm just going to set that right here, make sure it's kind of stuck to itself a bit, and set it down. And I'm going to take my char material, and I'm going to take it. A chunk of char, set it right onto that cedar pile, and I'll just set that to the side. Get my ferro rod. I know I should put down a, a small bed just to make sure I'm not sitting right on the earth. Put a couple of pieces down. It's a good habit to have, and that way your fire is not touching the moisture of the earth, right? So, nothing fancy. I know I'm not being fancy. This is pretty basic. So I'm going to take my ferro rod and my saw, the saw blade on my pocket knife, 
So I've got lots of different ferro rods on me. I just, for some reason, seem to use this combination. I don't know why. But if I throw a ferro rod spark onto that char, that char is already ignited now. And there's an ember that's rolling across it. Put all that back together and in my pocket. Now what I want to do is kind of pick up this cedar bark and kind of wrap it around the char material. I don't think I've ever had such a difficult time with red cedar bark. Wow. Well, only one cure. The balsam trees in this area have a highly flammable resin. Well, I might not need to use it. You can see that balsam resin just took You can see the, the char did create an ember easily, just unfortunately the cedar bark was very resistant to taking any type of flame. Hopefully this holds now. In fact, I'm going to take a few more of my sticks and uh, see if I can put some more balsam juice on it, if you will. Just won't go. I don't even know what to say. Am 
my whole example of what I wanted to do. Oh well, let's take it back down to the embers. I can still see an ember in there. Just won't, won't burn. <laughs> the cedar wouldn't go. So, I'm just going to throw a bit more char onto the top of it. Just to save on the ferro rod. See the flames keep wanting to come up and then dying right back from the moisture. But I think that additional char cloth might have saved the day there. It always happens when you're trying to give an example, right? <laughs> But the heart of it really was, even though there was unfortunate that the fire had a bit of a time starting, the heart of it really was how easy it was for the ferro rod to ignite the char. So I normally keep a tin of char in my bag with me. And like I say in this video, I want to show the making of more char. I'm successfully up to the fuel wood. Like I say, that was a bit of an embarrassment, really. Now the thinking really is I'm going to take that tin that we packed all that wood in, and I'm going to set that right into the fire. I'm going to try to get it in as right into the heart of it as much as I can. Now it's going to smoke and give off gas and that kind of stuff. It's got to be in there for a good half an hour, 45 minutes or so. And it'll end up taking all that wood that was in there and turning it into char. So you can see right here, I've pushed that tin right into the heart of the fire and it's going to sit in there for a good half an hour, 45 minutes. In essence, I'm just going to cook the wood that's inside there. Now because it's in a sealed container, the wood won't go to flame. It'll just turn to char, almost like charcoal. And so I know that red cedar really didn't help uh, the whole process here, but the heart of it that I wanted you to understand was the concept of how easy it was for the ferro rod to get the char ignited and for that char to then hold that amber. You know, it's unfortunate that uh, the moisture was in the uh, red cedar and just wouldn't take the flame. Uh, you know, normally I would dry that out, keep it in a pocket and that type of stuff, let the warmth of my body kind of dry things out a bit. But, uh, you know, when you're out in the field and you're doing things, it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. One of the interesting things I want to point out though is by adding additional char, and blowing on it, you can drive char to the point of being flame as well. I didn't really have to use the cedar bark. I could have used the whole pile of char. I just don't really want to do that because as you can see, char is something that you got to go through a process to prepare. So you got to cook it off in the fire for half an hour, 45 minutes, that kind of thing, right? It's just uh, it's time and energy to do those things. And it's I guess the same with the red cedar bark, and, and there's energy in going to harvest that, but I don't know, char to me is one of those things where I try not to use too much of it 
that one time. And I don't know why, maybe that's just me. But you could see though, by using the additional char, it did help bring things to flame. And that was really the key in order to get the tinders going and the fire to get to where it's at right now. So you can see now, I've pushed the tin right into the heart of the fire. I want it to really cook. I want to make sure that it's in high heat for at least half an hour, 45 minutes. And when you take it out, don't take it out and open it right away. You take it out and then you let it cool down. It has to come right back down to room temperature again before you open it. If you open it when it's still hot, the oxygen will get into it and it has a high potential of just uh, self-combusting. So I managed to get a few extra logs off the land here. And the wood's really, really wet. So under that premise, if you wonder why I've kind of got all these pieces of wood sitting around the fire and not in the fire, it's they're really just drying out. They'll be the next ones to go on, but they try to dry them out as much as possible before they even hit the flame. So either way, I won't leave you hanging when it comes to showing you the char. I will show you the end result and how it's just the same as the char tin that started with things. Of, and it's really the way to keep the life cycle going. But I know the sun's starting to fade a little bit, so I am running low on time. But I'll pull that char out in probably 10-15 minutes or so and uh, let it cool and then I'll show it to you probably as the closing scenes. But if you enjoy this type of content, please like, share and subscribe and thanks for watching. Like I say, this isn't the end of the video. I'll, I'll pull the char out and we'll show that kind of stuff. But I figured I'd get this part in before the sun's gone and, you know, things turn dark. Even if I have to put on the headlamp and, you know, do strange and magical things to get enough lighting happening here. So you guys can see the end result of the char. I will, don't worry. But uh, I really hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you like this assault shelter. I think it's fantastic. All right, well, let's get that charging out of there. Oof. I did manage to get the fire to kind of pick up, as you can see. Now I just got to let this jar tin cool down, get all the hot embers off it. That type of thing. It's got to sit and cool for a good 20 minutes, half an hour or so, and then I'll show you the insides. Okay guys, so I came out to the river again, get out from underneath the forest coverage and that way the lighting's a bit better. But the char has been cooled now for about half an hour or so. And just to show you, it's pretty well the same product that I started with in the beginning of the video. So as you can see, if I threw a ferro rod spark into this, it would take really easily. Just the same as the other char did that I used earlier in the video. But it shows you the life cycle of char. So really, every time you make a fire, if you're using char as the way to kind of get the fire going, make sure you put some wood in and turn it back into char by cooking it in the fire and get ready for the next fire. It's kind of a next fire mentality, really. Of you know, you don't have to use all that char that's sitting in this tin for a single fire. I mean, you could, but it's always just planning for the next fire that you're doing and having the resources available to do it. But there you have it.